we are continuing our series, Greatest Hits, as we look at the Psalms. But before we go there, we've got some greatest hits here I want to read to you. You guys know the song Imagine by John Lennon? Like it was his number one song that he did as a solo. These are the words he sang that were so popular in 1971. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us, and the world will be as one. Great lyrics, right? He's drawing this picture. The world's going to be this perfect place where everybody's got unity, no fighting, only love, everything shared, no heaven, no hell, no religion, no reason to kill or die, just people living for today. And notice how there's no hierarchy, there's no authority, no countries, no religion, just a level playing field for everybody. And this song struck a nerve in the early 70s. I mean, this was popular in this hippie movement, Vietnam War, Woodstock, and just peace-loving people who were like, yeah, this sounds so good. And this is like the birth of secularism coming to America. If we get rid of religion, if we get rid of authority, if we get rid of reasons for people to fight, then we'll have this perfect utopian world, right? Fifty years later, how are we doing with this? Not so great, right? We read these words and what we see is we see John Lennon's view of what utopia could be. And we see, and it's attractive. I get it. We want a place without war. We want a place without violence, without hunger, that's full of, uh, where black lives matter and blue lives matter and all lives matter and all lives are taken care of. Who doesn't want that? We want a world characterized by peace. But even with so many people thinking that they could follow his roadmap to that world, what we found is it doesn't get you there. Just saying, let's get rid of the government, let's get rid of authorities, let's get rid of religion, and just everybody sing kumbaya and love each other is not a way forward. Perhaps you very much enjoy this description that John Lennon wrote about here of uh, everything being shared. You wonder why religions can't get along. But maybe your view of utopia is very different than this. You hear the words of this song and you think, that to me sounds a lot like socialism. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm real keen on just everybody sharing everything with everybody else. I don't know how that'll actually work out. You want the peace that's described here, but your path to get there might be very different than what's described in this song. And I think the one thing all of us in common have in this room is that we all agree we have not reached a utopian world yet, have we? We're still in a very, very broken world. Just in the last few weeks, we've had the school shooting in Uvalde, and that was like a week or a week and a half after the shooting in Walmart in Buffalo. And then a few days after the shooting in Uvalde, the Salt Company, the big campus ministry in Ames, has two beautiful young ladies gunned down right before a campus ministry. We've got war going on in Ukraine. We've got this massive divide politically with the, uh, the, the stuff going on in the news right now on the January 6th insurrection and where people are on both sides of the spectrum there. I mean, we are a country divided. We are a world divided. We've got different things going on with China right now. Like globally, this world is a mess. When we read the newspapers, we nod our heads and we say, if everybody wants peace, why do we have so much chaos? It's as though we as humans are bent towards evil. We are bent towards conflict. We are bent towards sin. 
In my experience as a decade of foster parenting, the stories that I heard of what parents did to their kids was heartbreaking. You'd get a little bit of the background information and you'd be like, how could they do that? And then you meet the parent and you go, oh, because that parent didn't have a chance. They had abuse in their past or they were an immigrant and the system was set against them. They had their own hardships and they had no clue how to be a parent. And you just look at the whole system and you say, it's just a giant mess. And I'm sure you all have your own experiences as well. It's not just me describing what's in the news or my experiences foster parenting. We've all seen the pain. The news of Stephanie Shenefield reminds us of the brokenness in this world. But what's interesting here is that as we're all trying to imagine this perfect world in perfect terms, or in the, these different terms, and we recognize one person's play, perfect place may be very different than another's. What we all recognize is that the world hasn't reached perfection. And so the question is, does God have a plan for what the perfect world is supposed to look like? Does he have a plan for how we're supposed to get there? How much does it overlap with John Lennon's view? There's actually some overlap there, surprisingly. But if God imagines a utopia, what does that look like? And so today, like I said, we're continuing the series, Greatest Hits. We're going to be looking at Psalm 72. Okay, so if you want to open your Bibles, we're going to read through all of Psalm 72. It's a prayer written by King Solomon, who's David's son. Remember, he was the king when Jerusalem and Israel was basically in its heyday. It was the pinnacle of Israel's prosperity. It was when the temple courts were built and erected to their most magnificent state. It's when people were bringing money and trade into them as a nation. He was the young child who prayed that God would give him wisdom to lead. And now we read his words in Psalm 72 of a prayer of how Solomon desires his kingdom to look. And before reading this, I want you to key in on four primary themes that we're going to see over and over in this chapter in this psalm. And that is righteousness, compassion, prosperity, and power. Okay? Righteousness, compassion, prosperity, and power. We read these words in Psalm 72. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. It shows up right away. May he judge your people in righteousness your afflicted ones with justice. Right away he goes to the compassion of having justice for the afflicted ones, not just the wealthy ones. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. We see this length of reigning that goes forever and ever. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. You keep seeing these themes, righteousness, compassion, prosperity, and power. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills, may it sway. 
May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. It's a lengthy psalm there, but you saw in the yellow, I was highlighting through, if you were following along on the screens, these topics over and over and over. The righteousness of the king, yet his compassion for the needy and the afflicted to crush the oppressor. The prosperity and the abundance of all the people in the kingdom and his power. These are the four topics that we see over and over and over again. Uh, we see in just the righteousness shows up in verse 1, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 7. Compassion is in verse, 12, or verse 4, and then 12 through 14 is this huge chunk on that. Prosperity in verses 3, 7, and 16. And then the power we see that he's ruling across such great range and he wants his name to go on forever. And at face value, as we see these themes over and over, it sounds like a prayer that we would have seen by many of the other kingdoms in Solomon's time. That these kings praying to their gods for prosperity and power. And we might look at this and miss the important difference. And really this aspect of the righteousness and the compassion that we see in verses 12 through 14 are what make this unique. You see, it's the righteousness and the compassion that are fo the foundation for the kingdom. They are what come first. The prosperity and the power are what follow. Because Solomon views his kingdom and imagines this utopia based on him being a righteous and compassionate king, his prayer is that God would follow that with prosperity, not only for himself, but for all the people in his kingdom. That all the nations would be blessed and that his power would be talked about forever and ever. So often, people when they seek power and they seek prosperity, they want comfort. And they imagine that if they have the power, and they have the money, they have the wealth, they have the comfort, then they will have happiness. They seek what Solomon saw as the result. Whereas Solomon was going after the righteousness, the justice, the compassion. And he knew that if he went for those things, the result would follow. You see, people get that upside down. They're seeking happiness. They're seeking the results. Instead of first seeking the foundation in living a godly life the way that God laid out for Solomon to rule and to reign. But when we look at this passage, this compassion piece is what really stands out as being completely unique from the other kingdoms of the world. In fact, it gives us a little bit of a glimpse of how this passage might not just be about Solomon and his kingdom. In fact, when you go to the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 11, we're going to see a ton of similarities between what Isaiah writes and what Solomon wrote here about his kingdom. The difference being, in Isaiah chapter 11, it is widely understood to be a Christocentric passage. That means it's about the Messiah. It's about Jesus who is to come. That's what Isaiah writes when he writes these words in Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 5. He says this, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. That's the David's father. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness 
he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Do you see the similarities here in how Solomon says he wants his kingdom to go and how Isaiah writes about how the coming Messiah will rule and reign in his kingdom? And so when we look at these similarities, we go, okay, is it possible then that Psalm 72 is more than just about Solomon's prayer for the kingdom that he ruled over? but that it was actually the words of what the coming kingdom of God would look like. When we read this now, perhaps we see that this psalm is a foreshadowing of the eternal kingdom of God. All of a sudden now, instead of reading Psalm 72 through the lens of Solomon's time, I want us to look through at this psalm through the lens of Jesus and the coming kingdom of God of God that we read about in the New Testament. First, in verses 1 through 4, it's all about justice and righteousness. The first two verses, we see what's called a chiasm. That's in Hebrew poetry. It goes A-B and then B-A. So it talks about justice and then righteousness in verse 1, and then in verse 2, righteousness and justice reversed. So we know this is the theme that is going to be about this kingdom. And justice doesn't mean just good things for everybody. When we read through verses 1 through 4, the wicked are going to be snuffed out. There is a judgment for those who are opposed to the good and righteous king. So often we think of justice and we're like, well, justice is just good for everybody. It's good for everybody who follows the laws of the kingdom. But it's bad for those who are against the ways of the kingdom. We see that Jesus himself sees the oppression in the world. He sees the evil and he's angry. Just like you and me, he wants to make wrongs right. He wants to defend the helpless and crush their oppressors. He lived that out. He met with those who were the outsiders. He healed the lepers that nobody else would touch. And he scolded and he tried to correct the Pharisees who were elevated. He lived that out in his earthly life. And he talks about doing that in the coming kingdom in Revelation. The difference between Jesus and us is that while we just get angry when we see injustice, but we feel completely helpless, Jesus, as God, is able to actually do something about it. And so when we see things that seem completely unfair in this world, when we look at things and we see the wicked are prospering, and those who are living a godly life are suffering. And we say, God, this doesn't seem fair in any way at all. We know that we worship a king who is righteous and who is just. And while he may not bring vindication on this earth in front of our eyes, it doesn't mean that he won't vindicate those who are righteous and punish those who are wicked. Moving on, in verses 5 through 7, we start to see the power of this king. And it's a power that's eternal. For Solomon, his eternal kingdom was impossible, but he wanted it to go until the moon was no more, he says. Interestingly, when we turn to Revelation chapter 21, we see the kingdom of God, there's no need for the moon and the sun because the glory of the Lord fills the earth. Jesus is going to be the king who can rule in his kingdom eternally until there is the moon being no more. In his kingdom, there will be no more death or decay, no more fighting and vying for power. Instead, for all of eternity, Jesus will rule on the throne in power. Where John Lennon said, I don't need any authority. We look and we say, no, we want a good and righteous and just king who has all power for all time, who sits on the throne, and we submit to his power. Not only is that power eternal, but it's universal. In verses 8 through 11, 
we see all this language about ruling from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Solomon never ruled that widely. Yes, his kingdom was enlarged, but it was not through all people groups. We worship a king that Revelation tells us every single nation, tribe, and tongue will be singing the praises of Jesus Christ one day. He is the king who will one day rule universally across all people of this earth. We look forward to that. And it's because of Jesus' sacrifice, it's because of His shed blood that everyone now, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, Democrat and Republican, we're all going to inhabit the kingdom of God together. His power rules through time and through all types of people. As the passage continues in verses 12 through 14, we see all these verses about the compassion of the king. He will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from the oppression and from the violence. The kingdom of God is going to be one that's filled with compassion for the poor and the powerless. The most kingdoms on this earth, even here in America, put the poor and the powerless to a side. Money rules. Money has influence. Even in a democratic nation, we understand that money still has influence more than just a regular vote. Like, that's just the way it is. We understand the statements like, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But Jesus is the king who is incorruptible. He's the king that he takes his power and he emptied himself when he came to this earth. He lived humbly. He served. He washed his disciples' feet. He he spoke to the woman at the well, the Samaritan, that his disciples were like, why are you talking to her? He was a man who went to the outskirts and spoke to everybody. He elevated everybody around him. They were all invited to his kingdom. His compassion had no end. Where Solomon was praying that he wanted to give justice for those people, the justice of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus extends even beyond what Solomon was imagining. And it extends beyond what most of us live our lives like. I mean, when I think of myself, there are times, you know, where I'm driving here in Sheridan and I see somebody on a bike, and you can tell they're probably a meth addict just by their face, and they've got all their belongings on their back. And sometimes I have to stop myself because my first thought is, oh man, you know. But Jesus looks at that the way we should with pity. Somebody who's oppressed by this drug that has completely decimated their lives. And Jesus has hope. He wants to bring healing. It's this love and compassion even for those on the outskirts that we sometimes can be quick to judge. That Jesus says, no, 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 guys. You need to pour out love for these people. As difficult as it might be, as trying as they might be on your patience when you're dealing with people who are different than you. We have to be a people of compassion the way that Jesus is a king of compassion for all. And why does he do it? Because they are precious in his sight. I love that verse in Psalm 72. Because they are precious in his sight in his sight. We have to have a little more of that preciousness for all people in our hearts and in our minds. And finally, in verses 15 through 17, it really focuses on this prosperity piece. Except it's not prosperity for King Jesus to sit on the throne and be the one who receives all the glory. But it's this prosperity for others that people will come and proclaim His mighty acts. Um, oh, I'm reading Psalm 71, sorry. Let me get over to 72. I've got to flip the page. May His name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through Him. And they will call Him blessed. All nations were not blessed through Solomon. 
but all nations will be blessed through Jesus because of what he did on the cross. And that's fulfillment of what God, the God, promise God made to Abraham. Going back to Genesis chapter 12, when God told Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. That's the promise God made to Abraham. And in many ways, it was fulfilled through Solomon, but that it was foreshadowing, that it is completely fulfilled and comes to its full and proper end through Jesus, who is a blessing to all who come to faith in him. That's the prosperity. It's not about riches for all the nations who are Christians, but it's this prosperity of spirit that we have eternal life and that we know we will be citizens of the kingdom of heaven in the life to come. And now as I've been talking about these four characteristics of the kingdom, you may have heard me speaking a lot about this future kingdom that is to come. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. But when Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God is near. And there's this theology that the kingdom of God is here but not yet. And so we understand, no, we're not in the perfect kingdom yet. We see too much brokenness and evil around us. But the kingdom of God is breaking forth. These four uh, descriptors of the kingdom of God, we should be a part of bringing to this earth all around us. We need to be people who bring righteousness and justice. When we see people who are being taken advantage of, we need to step in and make things right. We need not be people who cheat and steal, but we are people of integrity. We need to be people who understand that God's power is eternal and universal, and so we want to extend the gospel to all people, not just to Christians within our doors or those who look like us. But we understand the gospel goes out to everybody. We need to be people who have compassion for those around us. For those who might be difficult, the unlovable. There are some people, honestly, being around them is a challenge. We know those people. And it's easy to just be like, I'm done with them, I can't. But Jesus calls us to keep going back. To love them as best as we can. To say, Jesus, I need patience to love this person well and to help this person out. Even difficult people need help. They need people to come to their side and care for them as described in this psalm. And ultimately, we see then that this prosperity is for the benefit of others. We have to understand, we are blessed. If we wake up with a roof over our heads and food on our table, and we have everything we need to live from day to day, then God is blessing us. And we need to recognize that all this that we have, we may look at our bank accounts and be like, I'm not that rich. Yes, you are. Compared to the rest of the world, we're all rich. How can we re use our resources to bless others? I look at these offering plates right now filled with money, and I say, thank you. Because this is how we use our wealth to bless others. We're a blessing, our mission's giving as a church. 16% of every dollar that comes into our offering every Sunday goes out to missionaries. We take the prosperity that God has given to each one of us individually and we use it to bless others. That's what kingdom living looks like. And I'm proud to be a part of a church that does that so well. These are all the ways that we live the way that Jesus desires us to live in this kingdom Solomon prayed about and it's this kingdom that Jesus now rules and reigns over and that which we get to be a part of. Now, there may be some people in this room that aren't a part of that kingdom right now. To be a part of God's kingdom, you actually have to submit to His authority and to Him being the king. It's not just an automatic that every single person is automatically dropped into the kingdom of God. To be a citizen, you have to recognize that there is an authority over you. That Jesus describes how we enter the kingdom. It's by submitting our lives to Him. We make Him Savior through the death on the cross, but we also make Him Lord. 
which means the authority, the one that we submit to, the one that we follow, we obey. That's what life in the kingdom looks like. If you haven't taken that step, it's hard to take the rest of the steps. Then you're like John Lennon just saying, I want to make all these great things, but I'm not going to do it God's way. To do it God's way, we have to make God first and foremost in our lives. And then as members of the kingdom, we learn to act accordingly. We learn to live out the justice and the righteousness and the compassion. And I don't have a million ways to tell you how to do that. This is why we had that message on the Holy Spirit, the series on the Holy Spirit a few weeks back. Because we live by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God says, hey, you need to step into this messy relationship with this person and help them out, then be obedient and do it. If the Spirit of God tells you to help stand up for that person because they're not being treated fairly, you need to do it. We trust that the leading of the Spirit will help you live this kingdom lifestyle. We don't have a book of ways to do it. We have a Spirit of God guiding us, leading us, and modeling for us how to live this out. So let's invite God to show us how to act justly and love mercy in our day-to-day lives. Yes, there is a time to imagine how amazing life will be when Jesus returns. And it is going to be amazing with the streets of gold. But in the meantime, we need to live it out in the here and the now. So let's live this kingdom out here because it is here today. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you.